you to this virtual event celebrating the publication of Amy Nizuka Matatil's new book, World of Wonders, <laughs> of fireflies, <laughs> whale sharks, and other astonishments. Editions. But first, we have some housekeeping announcements. Your microphones are muted and your video should be off, but you may type in questions in the chat room at any time and we will get to those as many of your questions as we can uh, in the time that we have. Uh, Square Books has a very active schedule of virtual events. And you may see announcements for those by visiting our website, squarebooks.com. There you may also sign up for our weekly email newsletter, Speed Reader. We also post events and other book news on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. On our YouTube channel, you can see recordings of past events, including the event yesterday for Richard Grant's book on Natchez, The Deepest South of All. Our next event will be a Crossroads book group. Following the murder of George Floyd, we wanted to bring people together through books to discuss race matters towards achieving a better future. So September 8th at 5.30 Central Time, Eddie Gloud uh, will join us to discuss his new book, Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our Own along with our friend Kiese Lehman, who is the author of three books, most recently his lauded, brave, and bold memoir, Heavy. On September 9th at 5 p.m. Central Time, Brittany Barnett will join us with her book, A Knock at Midnight. It's a story of hope, justice, and freedom. It deals with the inequality of our criminal justice system. She will be in discussion with Tucker Carrington, the co-author of The Cadaver King and the Country Dentist, A True Story of Injustice in the American South. On September 10th at 5 p.m. Central, Bobby M. Mason, whom George Saunders called a strange and beautiful writer, will share with us her latest novel, Dear Anne. She will be in conversation with Lisa Howarth, co-owner of Square Books and author most recently of her novel, Summerlings. On September 14th, which is also 41st birthday, Ron Rash will join us with, along with uh, John Grisham to present Rash's newest collection of stories, including a novella based on his novel, Serena. The collection of short stories is called In the Valley. All of these events will be on Zoom. To join, you can send an email to rsvp at squarebooks.com with the book title, author, and the subject line, and you will receive an email with a Zoom link one hour before the event begins. So now to the main event tonight. Amy Nizuka Matatiel moved to Oxford, Mississippi as a John and Renee Grisham visiting writer in residence at the University of Mississippi a few years ago. She made Oxford a, a brighter place, and we were delighted when she and her husband, Dustin Parsons, decided to stay on and take a position as a professor of English and creative writing in the university's MFA program. We were honored to host her publication launch for her fourth book of poetry, Oceanic, which went on to win the Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters Awards. Um, while we had donuts for that event, uh, we don't have donuts tonight, but everyone is at home, so you can feel free to raid your refrigerator. Uh, tonight, we are celebrating her newest book, World of Wonders in Praise of Fireflies, Whale Sharks, and Other Astonishments, published by Milkweed Editions, and it's accompanied with beautiful illustrations by Fumi Nakamura. This is a book of ace essays on nature, but it's nonetheless poetry, and it will reawaken the sense of wonder in everyone who reads it. So there's no better person to join us for this conversation with Amy than former John and Renee Grisham writer and resident Kiese Lehman, author of three books, most recently his memoir, Heavy, and he also 
also teaches at the University of Mississippi in English and creative writing in the MFA program. And aren't we lucky? Uh, and, uh, and he wrote uh, World of Wonders. This book walks, it sprints, it leaps. Most importantly, the book lingers in a world where power, people, and the literal outside wrestle painfully, beautifully. Uh, tonight is a special uh, treat. Um, whoever orders the book, will um, World of Wonders, will receive not only a signed copy of World of Wonders from Square Books, but also uh, one lucky person will receive a signed copy of KSA's book, Heavy. So here we are. Congratulations, Amy, and welcome to you and KSA. Thanks so much for being here with us. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. So um, I just want to say I'm so happy to be here with you. And, and Amy agreed to just do a little bit of reading for those of you who haven't read the book. And then we're going to get into a conversation afterwards. And if you have questions, I just want to remind everybody, please uh, send your questions to the chat and, and we'll get to them um, appropriately. All right, should I, should I read a little bit, Casey, to start us off? Yeah. All right, it's great. Casey, I'm so excited. I was telling, you know, I was talking to you beforehand. I, um, it's so weird, first of all, you're like down the street from me, and you know, um, and, uh, and yet I miss you so much in person. I miss you making me laugh in department meetings. I miss, uh, you know, I just, I miss you. So I wanted you to say, I wanted you to hear that as well. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I'm going to just read just a little snippet because um, I, I can't wait to chat with you, Casey, and I don't want to take up too much time. So I'm going to read a little bit from, um, from uh, an essay called Axolotl, but I'm going to share the screen. Sammy, I hope that I could share the screen. I, just because I, I have to share these um, the illustrations here. All right, great. Let me see. Um, all right, can you all see that? There's two of my favorites in here, the axolotl and the vampire squid. Both are um, illustrated by this incredible uh, illustrator named Fumi Nakamura. And I'm gonna read, so the axolotl is one of my favorite. It is actually my favorite um, amphibian in the universe. And if you don't have a favorite amphibian, you better find one, but I have a feeling it might be the axolotl. So this is just the beginning of it. Axolotl, Abyssinium Mexicanum. If a white girl tries to tell you what your brown skin can and cannot wear for makeup, just remember the smile of an axolotl. The best thing to do in that moment is to smile and smile, even if your smile is thin. The tighter your smile, the tougher you become. Give them a salamander smile. The axolotl is also known as the Mexican walking fish, but it actually isn't a fish. It's an amphibian. Axolotls are one of the only amphibians that spend their whole life underwater and are neotenous or without going through metamorphosis. Axolotls vary in color depending on which of their three known chromatophores they inherit. Iridophores, which make axolotl skin shimmer with iridescence. Melanophores, shading them a swampy brown. And xanthophores, which turn them, my favorite, a pretty rose gold shade of pink. Uh, I'm skipping ahead just a little bit. You remember trying out various shades of wet and wild lipstick, including a red color, the, can the color of candy apples in the junior high locker room after gym class. Your mother never let you wear lipstick and boys had not yet begun to notice you. You only wanted to experiment, to hold a tube of color up to your cheek the way you would hold a sequin dress to your body uh, in front of a mirror. Still, you love the way the lipsticks clacked in your friend's purses like dice, so you decide to try the boldest shade of red. Mm, Amy, I don't think someone with your skin tone should wear red. You might want to try this instead, said the girl who didn't have any brown friends besides you. The only brown folks she knew were on the Cosby show. 
You adored her, though, and you were the new girl yet again. You didn't want her to stop waiting for you at lunchtime, so you smiled, shrugged, and mumbled, you're probably right. An axolotl can help you smile as an adult, even if someone on your tenure committee puts his palms together as if in prayer every time he sees you off campus and does a quick, short bow and says, namaste. Wow. Even though you've told him several times that you already uh, attend a, uh, that you that you attend a Methodist church, but it's as if he doesn't hear you, or he does and doesn't care, chuckling to himself as he shuffles across the icy parking lot, hands jammed into his pockets. Wide and thin, the axolotl's smile runs from one end of the amphibian's face to the other, curving at each end, ever so gently up. Love that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, a little taste of, of of one of the essays there. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Amy, for reading that. And uh, so I, I just want to talk. I think it helps me that I can't see the audience, so I can just see you. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you first before we start for um, three things. One. Um, I want to thank you for uh, the first year that I had decided I was coming to actually work here uh, was the first year that you were at the Grisham House and you helped me feel home and, and a different part of Mississippi than I was comfortable with. I wanna thank you for that. Um, I wanna thank you for choosing Mississippi um, and bringing like thankfulness. I think we're very thankful people in this state uh, sometimes, um, but I think this book is among other things like a I feel like a thank you note to your own experience and to the world, like what you call the world of wonders. And also, I just want to thank you. So like when you sent me this draft, I don't remember what month it was, but it felt like everything was collapsing. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it felt, I mean, not compared to where we are now, but there was a lot of shit going on. And um, the book took me backward and forward. Like it, it reminded me of, of being in the woods across the, sh the road from my grandmama's house um just feelings just so absolutely small and beautiful you know compared to the world not singularly small but small in a collective way i hadn't felt that um in the, and then i read your book and so i just want to thank you for that but i also just want to talk about um choosing mississippi and one of the questions that i really wanted to hear you answer and i haven't prepped you for any of this stuff is like i wonder if you can talk about how your vision of the natural world of Mississippi, like how your expectation of the natural world of Mississippi differed from what you thought you were going to experience in Mississippi in the natural world. Can we start there? Yeah, yeah, that's such a good question. And oh my goodness, thank you. Um, you know, I, I said this, uh, I know it's embarrass embarrassing you because I know you don't want to talk about yourself, but you were the first person to ever call me a Mississippi writer. And I, I just get like reclaimed thinking about that because I've never, no state has ever claimed me, ever. I'm wow. like the central question of my reading, or my writing and reading. Um, so thank you for that. Before this gets into a whole like thing. <laughs> right, right. Um, but I wanted to say that, that you were the first, like, that's like, I could be done. Like, that's the only blurb I ever need is you called me a Mississippi writer. Like, um, anyway, so there's that, I think. And, and I want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding the question. You want me to talk about like what I expected or what I did find when I came here? Well, I, w I wonder how what you did find actually um, contrasted or complemented what you expected in terms of not Mississippi, in terms of necessarily culture and mores and stuff, but like the natural world, like the, the, the elements of Mississippi. And what, what did you expect? And, and I think the book shows some of what you found, but I'm interested in what your expectations were of the natural world of Mississippi. Yeah, you know, and that's to my great shame and great detriment, and I teach environmental literature and nature writing, so it's important for me to admit when I feel shame about something, I did not know a whole lot about Mississippi other than it was hot and swampy. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to goodness, that's, that's what we were taught, that's what we were taught in the books that I was given in, in my syllabi, you know, that, things like that, if they were mentioned at all, mm -hmm. so I knew it was going to be hot. When I first was here, it was going to be just a nine month like kind of southern adventure. And you know, and I and I love the heat. And after 15 years of being in upstate New York, I was happy to to come down um, to something a little more tropical. Right. Um, so I didn't know much. So it came from a place of 
ignorance. And I, I'm not saying that I knew every bird in the state of New York or every yeah. tree or anything like that, but I knew quite a bit. Right. So it was a humbling experience to come to the South, to come to North Mississippi and really luxuriate in this velvet ditch. The greenness, the greenness, the amount of trees, the amount of birds that are here. I just could breathe. <laughs> I right. could breathe. I, I think I wrote in my book that it was like little magnets in me snapped in place, mm -hmm. lined up in place in a way that I've never felt in any other place, in any other corner of this country. I could breathe. And I know it sounds odd maybe to hear it, but I felt safe here in, in, a, right. in the outdoors I was, than in any other outdoor situation I had been since I was a kid in Arizona. Um, so as a grown woman with brown skin, there's something about, I don't know, being able to hear bird song, being able yeah. to um, have that humility, like, I don't know what that tree is, but boy, I'm gonna look that up and draw it or sketch it and, and figure it out. You know, I can't, there's so much to, to learn here in um, the foliage and the animal sounds and the all the bugs, you know, um, it's so rich and fecund and I just, I don't know. I get so excited about the outdoors here in the South. Yeah, and one of the things that I really was interested in was the relationship in your work between wonder and, mm -hmm. and wandering, right? Because one of the things that you do like phenomenally well in this book is, you know, I'm always trying to tell my students and tell myself to like, we need to narrativize the encounter, right? We don't just need to talk about like what we've encountered, but we need to actually narrativize the encounter. I feel like that's what you do in this book so well, right? Like I learned as a person who got a D in science in uh, <laughs> junior and senior year, like I feel like I just learned things about the world that I didn't know, but I'm interested about wonder and wandering. Like in the process of writing these essays, do you allow yourself to actually like wander out outside the, the, the expected trajectory of like where you think you might go or like you often know or did you actually know what you were writing to and through like do you wander are you like a, a marginal writer and in a revision you bring it together this is more about craft than anything else but I really want to know yeah yeah that's such a good question too um dang you're bringing it with all the questions um <laughs> you know I think the root you know one thing I discovered you know a few years ago so still fairly new, is that one of the roots of wonder is to smile. Mm. And so I just was thinking, you know, I, the, I started this book a decade ago, but the bulk of it was written from 2016 on. And I really thought um, that was really hard to smile, you know, honestly. Um, right. And so it was a practice. It was a, um, it was like doing calisthenics to say what on this planet makes me smile. I need to do this for my children. I need to do this for myself. I need to do this as a teacher, as a partner. Um, and so it, it became like a practice. Oh, axolotls make me smile. Yeah. Oh, the catalpa tree makes me smile. It was kind of a recording of the things that made me smile, but also the things that I wanted to want, that I still had questions over. So I was not an axolotl expert before this, you know, um, I knew, quite a bit, but I wanted to know, you know, how is it you can cut an axolotl's arm off or part of its brain off and it'll regrow, you know? I want to know the whys of it. Wow. So I choose, so this book could have been triple the size, but I wanted to choose the 30 or so plants or animals that made me, again, feel humble enough that I, and, and excited enough that I wanted to learn about it so that it was a practice for me. And it, in that learning of the plants or animals, that's where the wonder came out. Mm. When I feel myself physically smile as I was reading some book about ants or whatever, you know, um, or the way a vampire squid moves in the water, that's when I was like, that's when that, that everything clicks. Like that's, that's what separates like, oh, this is gonna go towards the book. This is just right. happy reading, you know, that kind of thing. You, you notice that um, for a lot of us, there's that six to nine month period after we finish a book between when it comes out between when we finish it when it comes out right and 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 for most of us I don't care how many books you have or how lauded you are I, I just think that that's, that's a tough period for a writer what you write you're waiting for blurbs you just if you're like me you're expecting the worst um but between the time you turn this book in and when it actually came out COVID happened 
yeah. right? Is happening. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, I read this book twice before um, the pandemic and twice after the pandemic. And, 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 you know, rereading should be different experiences, but the rereadings of the last two times were just like, wholly different readings, but I'm interested in, 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 in your relationship with reading your own work post COVID and, yeah. and how, if at all, like what you expected um, this world to be in terms of like acceptance or, or rejection of your work. Like how has, how has, how has putting a book out, writing a book pre COVID, releasing it post COVID or during COVID, how has that affected you as a writer? Yeah. You know, um, you know, I just got, um, my my own copy like not too long like about a week ago you know um oh. so it's still pretty fresh but i did sit down and kind of take it all in and what is it like i think my students would cringe to hear this it hits different now right like, <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> oh it hits different now <laughs> I, know, I know my friends are like hey, you not them, it hits different it really does hit different and um I, i'm still outside but it's still ice isolated you know when we go out when my family goes out to Sardis Lake we try to go at a place where there's no one on the horizon you know and that's yeah. different that wasn't really a consideration when I was writing this when um when I was first here so and I'm an extrovert naturally so this is all very different right I would say I mean the easy answer is going to take me you know I'll probably have a different answer next month next year even right. too but what I can say at least initially is that you know, I could tell very much that these essays were written in a time when, uh, many essays were written in a time when I had to fight for the light. Yeah. Or I would just want to hide in, in my bed with, uh, you know, uh, uh, a weighted blanket over me. Right. And now that we're in a pandemic, I f am so grateful that I did that because it reminds me when I can't go out, when I can't go sit in a tree, or when I can't go um, wade uh, Wade in a in my favorite park um, in da in downtown Columbus or something like that. Like um, when I can't travel, it reminds me how much good there is on this planet still, yeah. and how much I want to do everything I can my part to be back on this planet with other people. It's not to not for myself, but I want to share this with other people. I want other people to be able to go outside too. Yeah. So that's probably the most um that's probably the thing that is striking me the most is that right. to wonder is to smile and I I want to smile with people, you know. Um I don't know if that answers your question. Like it I It definitely does. It definitely does still so fresh um but i know the feedback i've been getting it's been so wonderful people are saying i needed this i needed to be reminded of the outdoors i've been in my studio apartment i forgot there's a bird called a cassowary you know and and things like that so it, i hope that it's not i hope it does what i originally hoped pre-pandemic is that it makes you kind of not only grateful for so many things that are out there on the planet but reminds you to fight for them as well, you yeah. know, so that other, so that other people, it, it doesn't, it may, hopefully it makes you, you know what that saying, you catch more flies with honey, right. you know, nowhere in this book does it say we must recycle, you know, um, right. but I'm hoping that when you see the love I have for these plants and animals, and you get to know these names, that you'll want to protect them as well. You, you know, every time I've read the book, um, I've, I've, I've wanted to talk to you about audacity, so I'm going to do the inverse of that and talk to you about fear. Um, and we didn't talk about this, like when we start, first started talking about this book, but I wonder how fearful you were and or are to put out a book that to me, I'm sure has some antecedents, but I, I, I never read a book like this. I haven't read a book like this in terms of form. I haven't read a book like this in terms of the way you like you actually draw sentences. Um, so of course the book took an amazing amount amount of audacity. I haven't, I haven't read a book where like, you know, the author places themselves as a brown girl in a natural world and like saying what, you know what I'm saying? Like this shit is as much mine as it is the fireflies. So it's super audacious, but is there any fear? Like, were you afraid of like using this form, writing about the natural world, writing about the natural world and power? Like, were you afraid at all to do this book? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Because there, you know, to my, to my knowledge, there's nothing like it either. You know, I mean, you grow up, you know, you've heard me say this so many times, but you grow up as a kid in the, you know, late seventies, eighties, you never see, I never saw an Asian American person, man or woman or child outside, literally like in any movie, any mm. music on MTV, there's right. no Asian American woman outside or a person outside. So you begin to think, well, maybe Asian shouldn't be outside mm. or, you know, some, you know, like you just don't see it ever as acceptable in any way, shape or form. And in all the nature reading that I had done, the science reading that I had done, you know, as a eight year old girl on the floor of my libraries, I'd be reading about shells or the giant squid or how to make volcano or, you know, the actually what's inside a volcano or different rocks. I couldn't wait to see the back of the book. And I, I would say, oh, this person's my soulmate. And then it's like an old white guy. You know? Right, right. I just, I was always hopeful, like, oh, maybe this person's a woman. Maybe this person is brown, something. So I was totally scared because you get that enough and it's terrible to admit, but it's true. You start to internalize it. Like, well, maybe yeah. this is not your business. Maybe right. this, how, how dare you have a vision of the world that is different than Thoreau's or yeah. Annie Dillard or any of these amazing giants in environmental writing. How dare you put your foot in there as well. Right. But you know, Casey, something happened, not just when I had kids because I, was, I started this really before then. I just got I just got tired of it. Like, where are the brown people who who feel safe outside? And why is there so many of my brown friends who don't feel outside, who mm. don't want, who don't care to write about the outdoors, or who don't who've been made to feel unsafe? Um, why are my only why are, why is the main stuff that I'm reading never from an Asian American person's point of view about something mm. that I love so much? Yeah. Well, it just raised a bunch of questions that I had no answers to. And so maybe that's where the scaredy Amy, you know, had to be pushed aside and said, like, I, I, I want, I have to join in this conversation. And for nothing else, for my kids, too. I find mm -hmm. to, to model them. I don't want them to grow up and be like, Mom loved the outdoors. How come she didn't write about it? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, I think conversations about love, um, I think uh, substantial conversations about love are often rooted in, in, in loss mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and hopefully joy and pleasure. And I think one of the things I love about this book is that, you know, we, we, get, we get loss, we get lost, we get joy, we get pleasure, um, and we get innovation. And so I hear you saying that you, you knew you were trying to do something you hadn't seen before. But you're also doing something you hadn't seen before in the essay, right? You're using the essay as opposed to the, the verse and the lyric. Can we talk about that? Yeah, yeah. You know, and the, um, again, like, I think something happened. I, a lot of these started as poems, and maybe, maybe the poets out there can kind of see it a little bit. Um, but I just simply did not have room to breathe. You know, I talk about when I was here in Oxford, one thing I felt in my body, in my bones, is that I could finally breathe and exhale. Yeah. And I was just so sick of the, what I call the tyranny of the line break. I did not mm. want to be thinking about tension at the end of a thought, not a full sentence, but in, in mid-stop of a thought, um, which I love doing in poetry. I love it. You know, I love making that decision where you break the line and where you have the tension of the line. But I was sick of that. To me, that was a tyranny. You know, and again, think picture 2016. I didn't want even the conventions of poetry to be holding me back. I wanted my sentences to unfurl. And there are a lot of long, long sentences. But um, I just did not want to have to deal with the line break, honestly. <laughs> and so that to me, that was the number one thing. I wanted to be able to fully exhale in these poems, even, or I'm sorry, in these essays, even though many of them are short, you could feel, I, I hope that you yourself are exhaling when you get to the end. Right. You know, this is interesting. I didn't think we were going to talk about this, but the tyranny of the line break. So as someone who writes fiction and, 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 and nonfiction and traditionally essays, um, anytime uh, a poet moves over into like essay writing or fiction, I get, I get scared, right? 
<laughs> because 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 now you know and i think it's because after like training within the tyranny of the line break invariably when, it, when y'all get outside of that shit because you i think partially because you've been training in that what you call tyranny it just it becomes so expansive and then you know capitalism is always like oh shit if somebody else is expands so much like my world is is bullshit but like we believe it anyway um but I think it's so interesting to, to, to see and say that you found freedom in the essay form and not limitation. Absolutely. And, you know, and again, ye- years of internalizing that axolotl smile, you know, yeah. um, my buddy Ross says, like, he can tell when I'm a- upset because I just, you know, I still have a smile, but there's a specific smile that I do. Right. And years of doing that, I, I did not want to be fettered by anything in my writing anymore. Not that I was fettered in poetry, but with this subject, when I'm putting out my most vulnerable, tender parts out there, why would I be wanting to figure out or consider the line break, you know? Right. Um, I wanted to fully exhale and take up space. And for me, the people who know me, for me to say that I wanted to take up space, that's still like, I can't even, my mouth feels itchy. Um, it's hard for me to say that. It's really hard for me to say that I want to take up any kind of space whatsoever. But again, I, I just had to. I just had to in this. And I've never had that calling ever before. Even though, you know, my MFA is also in, in creative nonfiction. I just never had a more stronger calling to not listen to the line break. Yeah. The essays in this collection. It's because, oh. again, the subject matter. I'm yes. tired of seeing writing by white folks and not having had the room or the space to to let others in, you know? Right. And, and there's some, but it definitely could be better. And it's definitely better now than, say, in the 90s when I was trying to figure this out. Right. But it's still, we still got a long ways to go. Long, long ways. Um, I'm, I'm interested, though, like, so, so for you, there's not the... You, I mean, obviously, if you read this book, I feel like the answer to this question is is pretty obvious, but you don't feel like there's anything sacrificed in terms of rigor and beauty in 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 left to right prose, in prose as opposed to poetry. No, not the way. I mean, I think I love the um is it like the the blankness, the 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 peace and quiet of having a seizure uh, or mm. having a, a wide open space, you know, between stanzas. So I love that beauty, that sparseness. Right. You know, it's like putting air into a paragraph, you know, and then it's, you know, scattered on the page full of seizures. So I miss that. But, you know, I mean, I use section breaks. Right, no doubt. No. in there. So, and there's very, pur- we very purposely arranged those illustrations to give a different, so it's a different type of, breathing it's a different kind of take breath before you get to the next essay kind of thing so i just utilize different different um techniques there you know um morrison talked a lot about and wrote a lot but she also talked a lot about how like the sentences and the language should not sweat though we should sweat when we create the language and i'm thinking about the making of this book i was talking to our colleague in sociology uh brian foster the other day about his next book and he used a verb, he was like, these are the books I'm trying to make. And I almost started crying, right? Because like, that's what we do. And to hear a sociologist talk about making a book just made me feel, you know, it's pandemic time too, you know, any sort of like kindredness is gonna make you, make me sob. But as a, as a reader, like I like crafty books. And I think a lot of editors try to take the craftiness out of a book. Like I like books that feel made. And like this book is, it's innovative. It's it's like the the it's what I call in the pocket. The sentences are in pocket. Like you create new kinds of mystery. You can create new kinds of dramatic tension, and then you add the level of illustration, right? Which brings a, a sort of craftiness to it to me. Can you talk about the importance of having the illustrations in this book, and if you ever imagined it without them? Yeah. No. I I, ne- I always wanted. Uh, illustration. So when I was shopping around this book, I was just so happy that Milkweed didn't balk. You know, they were like, uh, actually, yes, please. We'd like to make that happen. Let me, um, can I, sh- I'm going to share a screen, Casey, to answer your question in just a okay. little bit. You're going to crack up with this picture, but um, let me see. Sammy, I think said it's fine. All right. I just want to share with everybody 
Wow. Here's little four-year-old me. <laughs> There's four-year-old me in my favorite place, still my favorite place, my, my mother's garden. This one's in Chicago, but my favorite place on the planet is my parents' garden. And at this point, I was, you know, the beginnings of reading and stuff like that. And of course, pictures played such a huge role in that. Pictures were very much a place where, you know, as I, you know, and I don't know, I don't know the psychology of learning to read, but you would hear words or I would hear um, a teacher telling a, a story and then I'd have that picture in my mind, but then she'd turn the picture around and maybe it would match up, but nine times out of 10, it did not. And mm -hmm. so I just love that interplay of, oh, that's what you imagine, or this was similar, but something else. And then you can layer upon layer upon layer, um, just that interaction with the picture. So I wanted to go back, so much of this was going back to that sense of wonderment as a child. Yeah. And I yeah. use this picture as a reminder to myself, but also kind of when I give presentations, I was asking myself, you know, and this goes back to your craft, like what brought me comfort from the outside world? Is it a body of water? Was it, cause I had a list of, you know, 200 things that I wanted to include and that would have been unattainable, but I picked the 30 most concentrated moments of interacting with the natural world where I felt at home and where my breath changed. Like I wanted to get back to that four-year-old Amy where I felt safe and everything was magical. Every thorn even felt magical. Like, oh, I, if I touch this thorn, I'll make a drop of blood. You know what I mean? Like that was me learning. Or if I lift this rock, I'll find little pill bugs, you know, things like that. Or if I pull off all these petals, my mom will spank me. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's the learning that I did on my own. My parents were so busy. They, it's not like they were sitting out there giving me the scientific names of everything. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I, I, I think maybe that answers your question a little bit and maybe even more so. But yeah. I want to go back to that four-year-old where I was hearing stories and trying to match up pictures, but then also creating pictures in my mind, the earliest parts of creating pictures in my mind. Um. Let me, we got a question that came in. I want to make sure we get, we get, because I think this is also connected to what you just said. This is from Chris. Um, it says, there's so much that literature needs to say right now. And I imagine so much that y'all want to say when you're writing. How do you decide where to focus? How do you know, or can you know, the limits of a given work? That's so interesting to think about limits in um, World of Wonder, because I, it just seems like a book that's filled with radical possibilities, but what do you think about that? How do you decide where to focus and how do you know or can you know the limits of a given work? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it it differs from every kind of project or even like even every time I come to the page, you know, and I, and I write, I handwrite all my everything. So um, when I get, when I say page, I mean page, not the laptop. But I think another way of looking at, this is writing in general, but specifically for this book, Another way of looking at how I was culling everything together was writing from a place of bounty and opulence mm. rather than a place of lack of like, mm. you know, um, you know, I said uh, the, the central question of my whole life has been, where am I at home? And so instead of saying, oh man, I wish I had a 30 year history of one house a oh, one yard, you know, instead of lamenting that, which I could do all day and that would have been, very interesting. I looked at as like, I moved around the world. Let me look at that as a place of, a, as you would say, abundance, as a right. place of bounty, as a place of, hey, this could be a good thing. I, I, I can blend in because I've been forced to move all over the country. I've been, you know, I know so many different plants and animals and constellations because I had to look at the sky around the world so many different times, you know what I mean? And find right. my own bearings. So, I guess that's how I help decide, decide what goes in the book is like, what were those moments where I felt such a place of bounty that I had to share it with somebody else? Not just to keep it inside, but I love that. what did I, I want love to that. share? Um, Danny said, oh, Amy, in a previous event, you talked about gaining something when writing about nature. You said we should walk away with some type of discovery, maybe about ourselves or the world. What did you discover while writing? world of wonders. Hmm. 
Such a good question. Danny, I think you're you're following me to all these events here. So I got to make sure I say something fresh and new for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, what did I discover? I discovered that even on my darkest, loneliest days, that I... And I love humans. I love my family so much. They're the most important thing. But I also had faith again in other people. When I, in the discovery of writing this book, it's not like I'm the only one who loves these plants and, and creatures by any means. I talked to scientists. I talked to conservationists. I, I did the research and did... So, so I had that communal moment of so many people. That's, that's their job, too. For me, it was kind of something that I was doing on the side. But there's a person whose job it is to study the whale shark. Every morning, they get up and try to, you know, track whale sharks' migration patterns and where their nurseries might be in the Maldives. You know what I mean? Like, it made me have faith in humanity again in times oh, when I needed it. Because there's so many humans out there that are doing everything, they made it their livelihood. They've made it their life's work to help these plants and animals. And anything I can do to help them or anything I can do to kind of, you know, to showcase the incredible, amazing, amazing work that they're doing. Right. It's hard to not, it's hard to not be inspired. It's contagious. That's the thing. And I'm hoping yeah. ultimately that my book is a little bit of, carries that contagious spirit onward. I mean, this book could have been triple the length, but I really distilled it into the most kind of contagious parts of not just all happy joy stories, but the ones where, you, where I felt when I was writing them, I had so right. much faith in humanity, which is weird because this book is about plants and animals. But right, right. Um, okay, two, two, two questions. Um, and then I have, a, I have, I have, a, I, have a, I think maybe the last question, but maybe not. Um, so this isn't a question as much as like Beth Ann just sent in a poem. <laughs> uh, it says, no one knew the axolotl. So Amy praised it. Now a lot. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> now a lot. Oh. All right. And then the other question is, um, I'm drawn to the idea of wonderment, not only as a way of seeing, also as a practice. Do you have suggestions for making wonderment a daily practice when it feels like the world is burning? And that's connected to the last question I want to ask too, but do you have a suggestions for making wonderment a daily practice when it feels like the world is burning? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that's the, the kind of, I mean, I could do a whole semester on this and that's what I do in uh, nature writing, you know? So I think one quick thing, and, and some of you like Danny, maybe you heard this already before, but I'm gonna say this real quick because it's, it's something that I just got so much amazing feedback from strangers all over the country said, I, I, I was dubious about this and I actually did it and it worked. I would say to designate one, you know, 25 cent spiral notebook or if you're any, anything like me, you have all these blank notebooks, designate one blank notebook, 25 cent spiral notebook as your sky journal. So a sky journal. And what that means is you don't have to do it every day. I'm so tired of people who are like, you have to do this every day or you're not a, a serious writer. No, you do you, <laughs> what, what, what works for you. But maybe there are four, just four, maybe three types of clouds you can learn while we're in this pandemic that you could just learn and watch YouTube videos about, look at the sky, track them, draw them. So you can finish this pandemic and you know what? You will know three new clouds by sight. You'll be that annoying person at, at dinner parties or whatever. Hey, look at those circo, circ no, no, that's a nimbulous cloud right there. You know, that kind of thing. I find that once you actually make it a practice, yeah. And again, that just, however, you know, there's going to be some days that's harder to do than others. If you sketch out clouds, learn three cloud shapes, you start, I don't know, that joy and that wonder becomes contagious. Then you'll want to know, oh, oh what are the names of all the moons? You know, today we're in, I mean, we're in a sturgeon mood. So that's something today. Fine. If you can, it's a little cloudy here in Oxford. Um, go out and sketch the sturgeon moon. You know, see if you can just like this is something you can do by yourself. 
memorize the 12 moons, not the, you know, um, and, and do the Native American names, you know, sturgeon, corn, um, uh, hunting moons, you know, things like that. Like, you can, you can name 12 Cardi B songs. You can certainly come up with 12 um, <laughs> names of the moon, you know, that kind of thing. Really? So I think once you get to, you know, wonder begets wonder, I think. So I would say to the easiest thing is to, to um, sketch the sky. That's something you can do even if you're not going outside. That's something you can do if you're in the studio. But designate one journal as a sky journal. And all you need to do, these aren't poems or essays, just write what you see in the sky. That's what's up. That's what's up. All right. So I have um, one more sort of packed question from me and then one more question from the chat. So the question from me is, it's, it's uh, uh, the first part I think I know the answer to. Well, well so I want to know, um, the first part of the question is, do you have a lot of hope for Oxford? And the second part of the question is, how can this how can explorations of our wondrous world make Oxford achieve its promise, help Oxford achieve its promise? So do you have hope in Oxford? And how can explorations, rigorous or not, of the wondrous world help Oxford achieve its promise? I want to hear you talk about that. And then I want to ask the last question in the chat. Hmm. Oh, my goodness. Right. If I had all the answers to this, I should be on the Board of Supervisors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not running. I'm not running for anything. Um, Yes, that easy, I, I can answer this part quickly, is that I do have hope for Oxford. There's no other town where I wanted to raise two um, mixed race sons. Mm -hmm. This is the place where I want, and you know, and they have Vietnamese friends, they have Muslim friends, they have a lot of white rich friends too, mm -hmm. and then all in between, you know, and I think there's a richness here and there's a richness I would say in the natural resources, first of all. Mm. You can be outside here almost 365, maybe one month might be miserable. But otherwise, put on a coat and scarf and you can be outside basically all year round. Um, mm -hmm. So that's huge for me. What I would say is that for almost all my life, I have been the one brown safe Asian friend. Mm. And I think I've had so many people be like, Amy, I don't see color when I talk to you. I'm voting, you know, whatever X, Y way, but I don't see color. I just see you. And I always, I always say like, so am I clear to you? Like clear Pepsi or something like that? You wow. know, what is that? Like, of course you see color, you know, um, but you're choosing not to engage it. So I think I will, I will say this, anybody that I've talked to here in Oxford, and this goes for my neighbors who complained that we had a love is love and, and uh, Black Lives Matter sign in our yard. Anybody that I've actually talked with or interacted with, I'm not saying that they are gonna put a Black Lives Matter flag in their yard, but I can see that they also unclench a little bit. They actually breathe a little bit. Just get, I think so many people in Oxford are not chatting with anybody that's different than them frankly mm. you know like the board of supervisors all white guys i want to know who they were talking to about um you know when they were polling their constituents what constituents i was who were they listening to right is the question right yeah so i find i said i the reason why i have hope is that when i have confronted people one-on-one -on -one, and i'm not talking calling them out necessarily but when i've confronted people one-on-one -on -one, across the board 100 percent they said, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize this, or I didn't consider your feelings on this. Yeah. What it means to walk past a statue of someone who would have raped or maimed me if I just happened to walk by that person, you know, a hundred years ago. They don't right. consider what it means to elevate that because they haven't had to, or if they have, it's in, it's a them, it's not a one-on-one, -on -one, hey, it's me, it's Amy, your safe Asian friend, you know what I mean? So I'm, not black, I'm not white. And I feel like there's something very special and unique about being able to talk so that frankly white folks listen. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a terrible burden. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily like it, but I also know that comes with great responsibility. And there's a lot of times where I've been quiet about things and just put on my axolotl smile. And it's very easy to feel defeated. 
But I find that when I, I don't know, I just, this is the place where I think my sons feel like they can be kind, tender, and vulnerable and know that some people besides their mother have their back. Besides that's their mother and father have their back. And that's, that, and that's huge. I don't know if they can find that anywhere else. You know, I'm going to embarrass my, my boys, but they, and you know them, they have some of the most golden hearts. Yeah. And that's, they also love sports. They're devastated about college football, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, or at least Big Ten college football. Right. Um, and that's hard hard to find anywhere else besides you know north mississippi where they their most vulnerable parts will be protected and not mm-hmm. made fun of and yet they'll also find someone to chat about college football with so i just feel like this is a very special unique place do we have a lot to oh, a lot more to fix and a lot more to make this even more open and welcoming absolutely mm-hmm. but I, again i i can't stress enough i felt more safe here than I ever did in Western New York. And I'm not othered here. Yeah. In ways that I'm always othered everywhere I go. I was in Greece. I was in Greece last summer. Oh, Greece. And someone, <laughs> you know, someone asked my friend who speaks Greece, you know, I could see them whispering and then they look at me whispering again. And then the one who spoke English was like, hey, she wants to know if you're Portuguese. And I was like, wow. I, even in Greece, someone's asking oh. me, what am I? You know yeah. what I mean? But the one place nobody asked me what I am is Oxford. Man, that's a commercial. We should end it right there. But there's one more question in the chat, which is a simple one. Um, what projects are you working on next? Oh, my goodness. You know, I always feel like so nervous and uh, maybe it's like bad luck to announce it. But um, I, uh, let's see, I'm research. I don't want to give too much away, but right now the books that are on my desk are all about snakes and I'm not writing a snake book I'm just reading about the natural history of snakes so that's all I can say right now and and yeah and on that note I've got two two little fun polls to to end with here um Casey your questions are so funny one of these polls involves you so it's the second one but for now for everyone listening in um all right this is just a silly question from two animals from world of wonder what would you ra- what would you feel more comfortable with if you encountered on a walk in in your hometown would you be more comfortable with 50 firefly sized flamingos or one flamingo sized firefly <laughs> or neither i want to hear what you guys have to say about that and i've written both in, in world of wonders i also write extensively about the flamingo and a firefly as well so i want to hear what you have to say so we can go ahead and vote and then the second poll for you all involves Kiesi and some of his language and heavy. So I think, I think maybe Sammy, we have to give it a couple, like a couple more seconds and then. Yeah, I think I have to end the first poll before we can look at the second one. Oh, okay, great, great. Do you want to put the results from the first poll? Yes. So overwhelmingly, people would rather fight 50 firefly size (laughs) 70%. Really? Okay. Oh, there's no way to show it on the screen. Um, No, I can't figure it out. Sorry. Um, But that's it. And then the second one, this is. Oh, now I can share results. There you go. You can all see. Wow. People would rather see tiny flamingos. I think a firefly would be so. Talk about wonder. Although I think you're right. If I was walking alone in the woods, and I saw one giant firefly, that might be. <laughs> <laughs> what did okay. you say? Poll two is now up. Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah. oh that's funny. But you would know the answer to this one. What were, if, what were, what can't say, describe everyone's pandemic hair? <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> you know what I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about when I say the way Charles Barkley pronounces it? Oh, yeah. Terrible. Terrible. <laughs> I said that to my class and nobody knew what I was talking about this afternoon. And they, and I was like, you know, Charles Barkley. And they're like, who? I was like, what? Child, last time I was teaching, I said outcast. And they were like, what? Out, who's an outcast? I was like, outcast? They, uh-uh. They're like, we don't get it. I'm like, okay. Actually, today, you know, I started all my classes with a funny poll as well. And I asked, who did you think when Brandy or Monica? And then the third answer was, I have no idea what you're talking about. 
all but two did not know what I was talking about. They have no idea who Brandy or Monica is. So. Oh. oh. No, it's not terrible. This shows who read heavy or not. You got to go back. Bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> Casey would say it's. What is the answer, Casey? It's meagle. <laughs> yeah, you can say. I can't say it the it's way you can. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amy, and 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 I just want to thank Sammy and thank Lynn and thank everybody for making time to come out. And please, y'all, do yourselves a favor and experience um, World of Wonder, particularly now. Please experience it and let and let's talk about it. Like you know, even if it's on a porch or on a computer screen, I think this book is to be shared in in like really radical ways. So, Amy, you want to say anything before we get up out of here? I'm just so, my heart is so full. You know, this would have been in person with everybody. So the fact that we had over a hundred people here um, gathered up, that's so wonderful. Thank you all so, so much. Square Books is the best bookstore in the world. And that is why, yeah, just as a reminder, if you order this by midnight tonight, one of you is gonna get, this is the hardback and, and he signed this. So no, no one's getting this one. But one of you will get, as Lynn is holding up, a paperback version um, of Heavy. So just on me. Um, so please support independent bookstores, um, Square Books. You know, I love y'all. Casey, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, sis. Thank you. All right. Thanks, all. Thank Peace. you so much. Goodbye, everybody.